And I'm feeling sorry, believe it or not, for the Speaker of the House as well. These days, the House Republicans actually give John Boehner a harder time than they give me. Uh, which means orange really is the new black. <laughs> Personally, I will tell you this, I enjoy tweaking the establishment. Nothing better than getting some boxers in a ringer over facts and revelations. Which means I will be one of those seeking to take in the soon-to-be-released film Nerd Prom. As it deals with what is called the wildest week in Washington. The White House Correspondents' Dinner, which has gone from being a solid bore to a yuck fest with some surprisingly candid moments. Our guest is a former reporter for Politico, who is proud to bring Nerd Prom to the screen, debuting April 10th. Welcome Patrick Gavin to Midpoint. Patrick, thanks for joining us. Oh, thanks for having me. Patrick, I would guess one of the things that came in a nerd prop, first of all, when you covered it as a journalist and others is, my God, some of these jokes are horrible. People just cannot really read a joke very well, but they've gotten better at it, haven't they? Well, yeah, I mean, it all depends. Uh, you know, it depends on the president. It depends on the comedians. Uh, it's particularly hard for the comedians because they have to follow the president, who really is the person that everybody wants to see. Uh, and then, yeah, comedians are used to sort of, you know, doing their, their stand-up as they see fit, but they really have to tweak it for that room. Uh, you know, it's a big room, the acoustics aren't great, the sense of humor aren't always there. Yeah, so for comedians, it's really a tough gig. When did this evolve, though, into what it has become? Because it wasn't that long ago when this was the correspondence dinner, the reporters would show up, tell a couple of jokes, everybody was happy. Now it's become almost something just this side of the Emmy Awards. Yeah, I mean, the, the sort of, Folklore is that uh, it changed once celebrities come, and, and people think that the celebrities started coming in the 1990s, and Michael Kelly brought uh, brought Fawn Hall. But the reality is, is that celebrities in Hollywood have really been in the DNA of this thing from as far back as the 40s and 50s. I think what's changed is people have realized in the past, let's say, decade or so, that you know, celebrities aside, it's a very good business opportunity. It's a great way to promote your brand, to promote your product, and to promote yourself. And so. That's why the dinner has now turned into not only a full weekend of events, but really almost a full week of events. I mean, it's about, it's about a week, five days of parties, about two dozen parties. Um, you know, it's a very, very busy week, and it's because there's just a huge amount of money in this town, and there's a huge amount, and people view this week as the primary opportunity to sort of uh, lobby, power, lo lobby power players and to get your message in front of what is oftentimes some of the, the richest and most powerful people in the world. Well, let's say this, knowing full well that some people in Washington never want to really reveal who they are, what they are, and what goes on, how did you get access to a lot of these people and a lot of these parties? Well, it was about 50-50, and we kind of take readers, or sorry, viewers to that journey in the film. Um, I mean, one of the ironies of, of the week is that the association that throws a dinner tries uh, 364 days of the year. Uh, to support journalism access, and yet, you know, no one's ever done a documentary about this week before, and for me as a documentarian to try to get access was actually very difficult. So, you know, in some ways, they don't always want to support journalism. Um, so I would say about 50% of parties, they didn't want me to be there. 50% did, although there was, there was always a mix of caveats. You know, you could come but not talk to people. You could come but we'll have to chaperone you. Um, you know, and to be honest, I, mean, I think a lot of people just, still uh, want to promote themselves. And so I think that even if they thought that maybe I would be covering this week with a bit more scrutiny than I have in the past, they still want, they still saw it as a good way uh, to get their own brand exposure and to get their name and face out there. Isn't that what this party really has become in the event itself? It's not even necessarily about what it's supposed to be about, what it always was about, but it's more about getting your face out there, getting your name out there, making sure that you can be the MC and getting the best joke out there to make sure that you're seen and branded. That's exactly it. I mean, I think that if you are somebody who goes to events, your clout is determined by how, how busy your schedule is. If you're somebody who throws an event, your clout is determined by how, uh, how many people you can bring to your party, the caliber of those people, uh, how many Obama administration official people you can get there. Um, you know, for, I think for a lot of parties, it's sort of how many bells and whistles and gadgets and, uh, vodka bars and specialty cocktails uh, you can provide. You know, so in a lot of ways, it is kind of uh, people trying to one-up each other to show not only how savvy and hip they are, but in a lot of ways how rich they are. I mean, I mean all these parties, I mean, a lot of these parties involve, involve ad trade-offs, so people are able to offset the cost that way. But just in terms of gross dollars spent, I mean, a lot of these parties are, you know, at least $200,000, dollars $400,000, sometimes more. 
so the reality is, is that I think for a lot of journalism organizations, it's a way to show their competition that we're still alive and kicking when, in fact, I mean, they might not be, but they've chosen to spend their money this way. Well, that kind of money, you and I both know, that's a drop in the bucket for the people in Washington, D.C. When you were doing a lot of stuff behind the scenes, was there anything that really, I mean, you've been doing this, you've been around Washington for a long time, you know the people and you know the way they act. So did anything really surprise you when you were making this film? I mean, I do think the fact that, I mean, what's so interesting is that, you know, when I was at Politico or before that at Media Bistro or the Washington Examiner, uh, I mean, I, I definitely did not cover this dinner with any depth at all. I mean, I asked really silly questions that weren't probing at all. And so I got access anywhere I wanted. Um, but then the second you kind of say the word, oh, I'm doing a documentary, and the second I left Politico, um, you know, the access dried up and people were a lot less eager. And to me, what that said was um, that I think news organizations didn't really want to be covered with great scrutiny. Because I think the word documentary implies, you know, more in-depth reporting. And the fact that I no longer worked at Politico meant that I had no boss that people could complain to, which I, which I think almost in their eyes made me more dangerous. I was going to say, because of that know, now, I mean, is there I anybody who's ever going to let you come back? <laughs> Yeah, right, exactly. Well, it's interesting sort of seeing whether or not uh, I get invited to stuff this year. Uh, I have gotten invited to a couple of things, but, you know, it's, it's even less than last year. So, um, yeah, that was interesting, especially for news organizations, because news organizations are constantly trying to get other people, trying to ask hard questions of other people all the time and expect them to, be, to give them access. But I think when it comes to being reported on, uh, it's a bit of a, it's a bit hypocritical. Are you a little bit surprised here? Because some people, they expected an entirely different film, but here's one critic, clear-eyed, very funny biopsy for diagnosing what's wrong with the dinner. You really hit a couple of things here. i got about 30 seconds left, but you really nailed it, didn't you? Yeah, no, and I'm very upfront about the fact that this is not the film I set out to make. Uh, it did sort of change as I started doing interviews, started doing reporting, where I realized that there was a much better story to be told and a much more important story to be told than the one I I set out to do, and so I think as a result, it is a bit more probing than probably the one I set out to do a year ago. Uh, but you're probably not going to get invited anymore, so there you go. That'll take care of that. That's all right. <laughs> I'll survive. <laughs> That's, I was just going to say, you undoubtedly will survive. Nerd Prom, by the way, has a limited theatrical release beginning Friday, April 10th. It can also be ordered at nerdpromthemovie.com. The name itself is outstanding. Patrick Gavin, thanks so much. Good luck with the film. Thanks so much. All right, take care. The new national champion of men's college basketball. Why do so many people just love to hate the Duke Blue Devils? We may get an answer. We may not. Midpoint will attempt next.